Assalamu alaikum. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be all of you. A few days ago, one of my friends sent me a video link where a Muslim scholar was claiming that uh, value of Baqa in Psalm 84 verse 6 is actually referring to the city of Mecca. So being a student of the book of Psalm as well as a minister in a Christian tradition, um, it intrigued me to explore uh, is it really value of Baqa or is there something else? So let's explore for this purpose. I'm using a PowerPoint a screen to provide some images as well as I am I'm talking about this all uh, exploration. Thank you. Well, first of all, happy Eid al-Zaha to all my friends, Muslim friends and uh, families, those who are celebrating Eid, although <clears throat> you are missing Hajj because of COVID-19, but our prayers and best wishes to all of you. Along with that, uh, uh, although you all know that this all uh, news started from the Turkish president when he announced Aya Sophia's new status, and he <clears throat> brought it back to the, uh, to the mosque from museum. Although I would like to clarify that this presentation is not a debate. It is not even a dialogue and it's even not a polemical argument. Yet it is my humble and bold invitation to academic and collaborative pilgrimage to God's dwelling place. So as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> the claim is that the Valley of Baqa mentioned in the Psalm 84 verse 6, 7 is the Mecca city in Saudi Arabia. So this is my exploration and my journey and I would like to invite you to join me for this journey. <clears throat> Well, concerning Aya Sufi and the video which I was mentioning, uh, there are different spectrum of uh, uh, perspective from various Muslim scholars. You can watch these uh, videos from this Indian, sub-Indian, <clears throat> indo pak context. However, the video which was sent to me about Zakhar Naik's uh, views on Radgan's converting Aya Sufiya, he claimed a few uh, interesting claims. Number one was, uh, in this video, uh, Dr. Zakhar Naik claimed that Aya Sufiya was purchased after conquering. Well, uh, we all know that conquering is not purchasing <clears throat> the new ruler who conquered the land and the people. He do whatever he wished to do with the, with the people. So concerning uh, the, the claim and the original topic of this video is, uh, <clears throat> is about that. Uh, again, it's been, uh, I came to know personally through this video. And, and then I watch again this claim where Makkah in the Bible or is the mention of Makkah in the Bible and the particular reference which has been shared was Psalm 84. So let's read first Psalm 84, what it's actually about, and then we will go uh, in a further deep exploration. So concerning Psalms <clears throat> uh, and Islam, I have already recorded a video with, uh, uh, with Javed and Al-Khamadi, so you can subscribe and see on my channel as well. Uh, so let's see the, see the Psalm. Uh, first of all, uh, in the book of Psalm, uh, which is Zabur in Arabic, uh, the particular reference which refer to Valley of Baqa is Psalm 84. Now, the, the title and the superscriptor of this Psalm and few keywords and terminologies will help us to understand actually what is the original context of this Psalm. Because mostly when our Muslim friends or anybody else who refer to the Bible or the particular words, they, they refer or they quote it without the context. So let's first understand the context. So this is Psalm 84 for the director of music. So the title itself say uh, that it is written for the musical performance in the temple court. Then according to Gitith, well, this is a musical term. Uh, we uh, are not sure what is this referring to Gitith, whether it is a raga uh, compared to the Indian uh, musicology, like we have Eman Kalyan, uh, we have uh, 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 Raga Darbari, or we have uh, Bhub Kalyan and Bhairo, or all this music, or this music raga based system. However, this is written by the sons of Kora. So sons of Kora means this is not a one writer; it's a group of writers and group of a uh, group of a certain family. Well, this family of musicians actually are the writers, authors, uh, thinkers, and creative artists. So we will go further and see who are these Kora height people. And this is a psalm means it's a poem. So uh, let's see the. Uh, I will read uh, for you only verse one and then verse five and six to find out what this psalm's key theme is and what it's talking about. So first of all, verse one refer and it says that how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. So first of all, it is about a geographical place 
built by human hands somewhere which this Korahite writer is talking about. Second verse five is saying that, blessed are those whose strengths in you, whose heart are set on pilgrimage. So it means the Psalm is also referred to our dwelling place of God, but it is also referring to annual pilgrimage. And this pilgrimage is, uh, is uh, further referred to, uh, to the people, those who are on the pilgrimage and they pass through a certain location. And this certain location they are referring to as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. And then the autumn rains refer to uh, a time of the year, which a time of the year this festival is taking place. Then the exact uh, uh, bigger map of the location is they go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Zion is the Mount Zion uh, that's in Jerusalem. Then verse 10, it says, better is one day in your courts. It means this is a huge, massive court or my, the king's court or, or, or the or divine court or on any kind of a temple court. Then a thousand elsewhere. And then I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God. So it means this Korahite a uh, writer of this psalm is also have another duty, which he is, uh, uh, he is, he is serving as a doorkeeper as well. So let's find out what this psalm is about and which dwelling place they are talking about. So when we go further, so we find here that first of all, we need to understand the book of psalm, which is talking about. So the, the name of the book of psalm in Hebrew is Sefer Tehalim. Sefer Tehalim means a scroll of a lyrical poetry accompanied with stringed instrument. So it is a musical, poetical piece of music which has been given to the director of the choirs by a guild of musicians and authors and writers and songwriters to perform in the religious ceremony. Uh, and because Book of Psalm is divided into a five major section, and uh, generally it is known as Psalms of David, and even the rab rabbis call this whole five uh, section of the book the Torah of David. Why they call Torah of David? Because Moses' Torah is also divided into five sections. And when we compare Psalms with the uh, with the Torah. So we see that here the book one represents humanity starting with the human being, then from the deliverance, then this Psalm actually 84 is from the middle of the book three. It, this part three contains 17 Psalms and their focus is sanctuary, the dwelling place, the house of the God. Then book four is a reign of God, God's kingdom, and then it's a word of God. So how this whole part refer to the, uh, to the uh, Torah? And even this book three is all about, about Levitical order and the Levitical order of uh, priests and sacrifices and how these priesthood and sacrificial system helping people to keeping the relationship with God uh, in form of their, their forgiveness and their sacrifices and their devotion to God. Well, the writer of this psalm interestingly help us to understand uh, actually who they are. As I mentioned earlier, they are sons of Korah. It's a whole group, a family. It's the same like a family of musicians and the gharanas in our Indian Pakistani context. We have Sham Jarasi gharana, we have uh, Patiala gharana, we have Gujarat and Punjab gharanas, all these gharanas who represent. So these are the families of musicians and singers and artists who have been assigned uh, in the temple. But before assigning in the temple, uh, when King David was living in the, in the palace, when he became king, so he was living in a palace, uh, but he realized that the Ark of God is living in the tent, which, which we call Tabernacle of David. And David erected that tabernacle and he, he gathered together all the creative artists, especially from the Levitical family. And from, that, from there, he assigned them various duties. Uh, so when uh, David showed his interest and his desire to build God's temple, he prayed to God and God has given him the blueprint, the vision of the heavenly court and asked him that I am giving you uh, the vision and the blueprint and the whole master plan which you make a copy and replica on the face of the earth. But David was uh, totally bare to build the house because he was a warrior and he shed lots of blood. So God said, you are not going to build, but your son uh, will going to build that. And 
uh, and David Aldo uh, collected all the material, the master plan, and everything, whatever required. David gathered even the assignments of the Levites, who is going what, what are the, what would be looks like the ceremonies, and what will looks like the, the whole duties of this Levitical order. So sons of Korah were actually they were great musical masters, and they penned the psalms. There are the whole group you can read, and uh, and, and in this particular section there are almost uh, twelve psalms. Then the occasion is very important. We need to know what occasion they are. This special Psalm 84 is referring. So uh, by the Mosaic law or the Sharia of the law, uh, Jewish nation was uh, required three times in a day to present at the assigned place. Every Jewish male older than 20, 20 or 21 years old, he was required to perform or to or to attend this ceremony these are three different occasions so this particular psalm 84 is referring to to the new year festival um, and what that new year festival was i'll show you later on but however in conclusion psalm 84 written by a family not one person a korahite singers and artists as well as doorkeepers and they were summoned from their house to travel along and come to perform their duties at the time of this New Year festival, which was a feast of booth to perform their duty. So uh, during this psalm, which our main topic is Valley of Baka. So before going further, I would like to clarify what is the meaning of the Valley of Baka. So Baka means Valley of Tears, Psalm 84 explicitly refer that this is the Valley of Weeping, Wilderness, Tears and Terror to reach the temple. So uh, this is the temple actually, which they are talking about dwelling place. You can see that how majestic and how captivating this majestic white granite building inside the whole court system. You can see that when God showed David the whole image and the whole vision from the heavenly court, this is just a copy of the original sanctuary in the heaven. So Solomon temple built 10th century before Christ mentioned in the Chronicles and first Kings, and the new Year festival, which this particular Psalm referring is Rosh Hashanah. So it was, uh, I think the autumn festival uh, starting in September, October, and then they, they, they started with the blowing the trumpets and then they live for a whole week in the, uh, in the tents. Uh, in a commemoration of their forefathers who traveled in the wilderness. And then Yom Kippur came, that was, the, that was the holy day, national holiday, because that was the time when high priest keep it, taking the blood of animal and, and he take it to the holy of the holies only once in a year and announce the forgiveness of the sins of the whole nation on this, on this day. So that's very important festival of the autumn. And uh, so this is a picture you can see that uh, Korah Heights are talking about. Mm -hmm. Concerning the Book of Psalm, we need to understand, uh, generally those who are not aware of the Book of Psalm, and especially our Muslim brothers and sisters and scholars, they think that Book of Psalm is only given to David, although it assigned or it's known as David's Psalm. However, the collection of the 150 Psalms, which are compiled in the Bible, they are not only by David. So there were 73 Psalms only written by David. It's in the Book of Psalm. 12 by Asaph, 12 by sons of Korah, Solomon written two, Moses one, Iman and Ethan one, and 48 are anonymous. Nobody knows who has written these one. So you can see that the, uh, the book of Psalm in the Bible is a compilation of 150 poems. The major part is written by David. However, when Quran talk about the, uh, about the previous scriptures, as we know that the, uh, the Hebrew Bible already divided in three parts. One is number one is Torah, then Katabim and Nabi'im. So uh, Nabi'im and then Katabim. So Katabim means the books and book of Psalm fall in the category of the third part, which is Katabim, the poetry and all these poetical uh, sessions. However, when Quran mentioned uh, these uh, books from the previous scripture, Quran mentioned these three, which included gospel, which is not part of the Hebrew Bible, by the way. This is the New Testament as a, as a gospel, we call it. So Torah, written given to Moses, Zabur referred to Psalm, and Injil referred to Jesus, and then the Quran referred to uh, Prophet Muhammad. However, there is another uh, scripture mentioned in the Quran, which is Suhuf Ibrahim. Uh, they are lost, nobody knows where they are, and no idea uh, where, they, where they're gone. There's another interesting element in the, regarding the relationship of Psalms and the Quran, because 
Quran explicitly mentioned word Zabur in Arabic, which is uh, uh, Arabic of the Psalms, is and the Hebrew is the Halim, is mentioned by name only three times, the particular book, which means in the Surah An Nisa, chapter 4, 163, Al Isra, 1755, and Al Ambiya, 21, uh, 105. You can uh, uh, search and, and, and read these Psalms uh, by your own self and, and these references actually. So uh, in my own research, as I'm uh, writing my final dissertation for my PhD uh, in Psalms and exploring Psalms for the peacemaking, especially to the world of Islam, I have find uh, striking parallels in this, uh, in this uh, journey. Number one, uh, Psalms as a common heritage of Christian and Muslim. So number one, all Muslim scholars and even a Quran uh, 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 evidently provide this reference that the Quran affirm that Allah is the same God worshipped by faithful Christian Jews and Muslims, the same source. Then the mode of recitation uh, since last 3000 years, book of Psalm has been, has been both uh, is a part of a poetry. It's memorized, recited, chanted, and transmitted through oral tradition, even the Christian monastic system. Then the, then the order of the chronology. We see that both Psalms and Quran are, are, uh, uh, are compiled in a non-chronological order. We see that the, the Medinan surahs are in the first part and the Meccan surahs on the later part. While the same with the book of Psalms. Psalm 90 is prayer of Moses and Psalm 137 is a uh, is a song of a, of a Levite or Levitical singer who is returning back from 70 years of Babylonian captivity. So you can see that this, these are striking parallels. Moreover that, our Shiite Muslim brothers and sisters, they have also compiled uh, uh, the Psalms of Islam. These are the supplication and prayers compiled and narrated by the Hazrat Zam al Abidin and few other treaties which they named it Sahifa Sajjadiyah. So that is uh, that is an interesting uh, and the seminal work of Islamic spirituality we can relate with the, uh, with the book of Psalms here. So uh, not only from the Quranic perspective, not only with the Shiite spirituality, but also in the Islamic religious imagination, book of Psalm has played a great role. Like al bikai from the 13th century's um, scholar and his work, Nazm al durar actually is the best example of Muslim Christian textual engagement. Then, uh, then we read uh, that, as I mentioned earlier, Surah Al-Anbiya. And in Surah Al-Anbiya, the, uh, the Quran developed it's theology about God's kingdom because God's kingdom is related and given to those people who are righteous. And as the rise of Islam and conquering the half of the world and the Levant, the Muslim Emirs and the Muslim Caliphates, uh, they they assume that this is a sign of God for the approval that they are righteous people because God is helping them in their victories. Uh, along with that, uh, Angelica Neuwirth, uh, uh, she is a, a, a German scholar and she find another striking parallel between uh, Surah uh, 78 with the Psalm 104 and Surah 55 with the Psalm 136. And she find uh, that the compositional nature of some chapters of the Meccan Surahs actually, and she find parallel structural correspondence and forms of intertextuality. So, so these are scholarly work are already uh, available and you can search on the, on the influence and, uh, and the parallel of the Psalm with the, with the text of Quran. However, concerning our main topic, we can see that Mecca was referred as a change of Qibla. Prior to changing Qibla, Prophet and the whole community of faith, they were worshiping and praying as a continued chain of the monotheistic religion toward facing toward Jerusalem. But then Jerusalem switched and changed toward Mecca. However, Islamic linguistic and, uh, and linguistics and jurists actually believe that this valley of Bakka from Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 96, is referring to Mecca. However, when we read the original Arabic text, we find that. Uh, in original Arabic text, we don't find these uh, parentheses, like here is the parentheses, like if you read the uh, translation, so you can find that verily the first house without parentheses appointed for mankind was that in Bakka, full of blessing and guidance for all people. So what are these parentheses then? Well, these parentheses, I assume, uh, these are later addition, whether by a translator or whether by an interpreter, or whether by uh, by those who who has published Quran, uh, or those who interpret 
uh, Quran for their audiences. I don't know when this notion came and how it came that they realized that because Mecca has changed from Jerusalem, so obviously uh, this Surah Al Imran is referring to the Mecca because it's changed now. However, this claim is uh, I'm not sure that this is the this is the true case. And what are my my logic and my uh, my uh, point of view? Uh, well, first of all. Uh, when Jerusalem to Makkah is changed, it's a major difference between Jerusalem and Makkah. Why? Because Jerusalem is a combination of political and religious center. It was an administrative and spiritual source. When King David um, conquered the, uh, the valley of or the, or the mountain of Jebusite, so it was a place of the Jebusite Aruna where he, uh, he, he made the site for the temple. And then he later he, he moved his capital to the to the Jerusalem, and that's why we can see that how uh, a couple, a few years ago, President Trump in America he announced and uh, accepted the Jerusalem as the capital of the, of the Israel, the state of Israel. However, this is not the case of Mecca because Mecca has its own distinct uh, prominence in the history. Since the pre-Islamic era and then the post-Islamic era, Mecca was a shrine. Pre-Islamic era, it was a pagan shrine, and post-Islamic era, it was a shrine for the for the monotheistic worship. However, Mecca has never been a political capital. Political capital was always Medina, not the Mecca. So Mecca, in this way, has a, uh, has a distinct and a prominent place that it does not mix up the state and the religion and and the Christian church or the Christian nation actually need to learn how to separate. Uh, how to separate the state and the religion from the from the model of Mecca? So, uh, why why our Muslim scholars need to prove Mecca in the Bible? As I mentioned earlier, it's not written or it's not mentioned in the actual Arabic text. It's added later because of the interpretation. But why they need to provide Mecca in the Bible while already Mecca mentioned in the Quran in a, in a very sophisticated way, like uh, in contrast to Mecca, the actual word Mecca is already mentioned in the Quran as city of safety. If you read Surah Al-Fatah, chapter 48, verse 24, it's mentioned as, uh, uh, as a city where anybody can, can go and hide and, and their life will be safe safe over there. So uh, this is the same, uh, once again, parallel between the, between the Jewish understanding of the temple court and especially the altar where they, where they burn the sacrifices because there are incidents that altar was considered a safe place. Whoever run for his life and they want to, uh, they want to, uh, uh, to be a safe place and they, they want to be at a place of a refugee, they go and, and hold the horns of the, of the altar and nobody, nobody touch them. When we read the story of Adoniah and then Joab in the story of, in the chapter, in the book of First Kings chapter 2, they both ran for their life and they hold the horns of the altar and nobody was allowed to touch them and to kill over there. They're the same concept of the city of Mecca as a city of safety. Then implicitly there are two other references, uh, Surah uh, chapter 6 verse 92 and then chapter 42 verse 7 in the Quran which is called the city Umm al Qura, meaning mother of all settlement and cities. So uh, the Makkah has its own distinctive place and a role to play in the Islamic history. I don't know why they need to prove it from the Bible. Anyway, in my opinion, why Valley of Bekka is not Mecca? So here are my uh, external uh, argument. So my first, I have gave you internal from the book of Psalm, then from the uh, from the Quran, then from the uh, internal uh, internal evidences from the Quran. Why it's it could not be a, a Mecca, and then I'm coming to the external point. Number one, why Bakka Valley is not Mecca? First of all, historically, because thousand years before the arrival of Islam, the Solomon Temple was the center of Tawhid uh, and a Jewish place of pilgrim of mind, Zion. So while at the same time, the Mecca was the center of shirk or paganism with more than 300 god and goddesses in the Kaaba, even after uh, when uh, 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 at the time of the conquest of Mecca, uh, Prophet consecrated that place and they all take, took out everything uh, and it was uh, consecrated as a monotheistic worship place under, uh, under the control of the tribe of Banu Quraysh. So you can see that it, it was still the same. 
And number two, why Baka Valley is not Mecca? And that is because of the linguistic meaning of the Valley of Baka. As I mentioned earlier, Baka means Valley of Tears. It's a place, Imika Baka, weeping and uh, uh, and the Korahite travelers when they are passing through they encounter the valley of weeping it was a dry arid lifeless place so why mecca we need mecca to be looks like this valley of tears while mecca is a place of a uh, place of a comfort it's a place of a spiritual nourishment it's a place of a of as a as a place of god's house so why uh, why Baka should be Mecca? I don't think so. That's the case. So this is a, a second uh, external evidence. The third one is modern technology help us actually to understand because when you uh, when you put word uh, value of Baka on the internet any search engine it will give you two locations one in the eastern border of the Lebanon Valley and near the Syrian eastern border and the Lebanon and the other one in Jerusalem while uh, if you add or you search Mecca, Mecca is still Mecca. So, uh, so technology and the and the modern uh, Google search engine or any uh, app can help us to find out that there are two distinct and separate places, even even in the in the geographical location. Then the most interesting part is is that Baka Valley is not a destination, while Mecca is destination. For the, for the Muslim pilgrims. So Valley of Becca is only transition. You can't, you don't want to stay actually, if you're on a pilgrimage, you don't want to stay there because that's where you want to run. You don't want to be there. Uh, no reason to stay in the Valley of Wilderness, a place of weeping, dry and dead place of mourning. It is only a transition, not destination. So I can compare this uh, Baka with the, uh, with the phases of uh, Hajj. When any Muslim pilgrim reach to, to Saudi Arabia, they don't go directly to the, uh, to the Mecca. They have to be at a place of Mekath. It depends on which direction you are coming. So the Mekath is a state of consecration, continues until the completion of certain duties, like, like, uh, like shaving a head for a male, then wearing, uh, wearing a white piece of uh, unwrapping in a, in a proper way, then preparing soul, mind, body, heart to enter to the Mecca. So Valley of Becca, uh, in terms of comparison, is, um, is a place of Mekath, where they prepare and they are hoping to see and reach final destination soon to in, the, in the house of God. And while you don't want to stay in Mecca if you're performing a Hajj in Mecca. So Valley of Becca, you don't need to stay there. You need to, to move further. So I don't think so that my Muslim friends want to stay in the Valley of Becca or refer that Valley of Becca is actually Mecca. Now, uh, the major question is this, why people or why this, these pilgrims running toward this place? And the answer is, because this is a holy place, but what makes this place holy? Obviously, presence of God. That was the promise which God made with Solomon when he prayed. And, and you can read this, his, his prayer in the, chapter, in the uh, book of Chronicle, chapter six, actually, when he prayed and asked God that he may come and stay in that temple, that he may put his eyes on this temple. And whoever uh, uh, prayed toward this place, may God listen. And God answered Solomon's prayer and says, yes, I will, I will live in this place. And then God's glory in a form of a cloud, Shekinah, entered at the time of the consecration. However, because we know that Solomon has a terrible, uh, terrible end of his life, his heart was totally departed from God. He built other pagan uh, temples to, for his wives, and that's how his heart was not. Uh, his, his heart was totally uh, become dark toward God, and ultimately, because of the of this reason, the whole nation corrupted. The whole nation forget God's rule. They they enter in a pagan worship, and they totally forget what God has done for them. That was the reason. God's glory. Because of this disobedience, God's glory left that holy place. And the glory of the Lord, Ezekiel chapter 10 told us, left the first Solomon temple. And the result of this abandonment and this whole uh, paganism, God punished his people through pagan powers. And God brought Babylonian power to sack the Jerusalem, burn the temple, 
and uh, totally, totally destroyed the Jerusalem and sent them for 70 years in Babylonian captivity. So after 70 years captivity in Babylon, Jewish came back and they start building the temple again until, uh, until the first century. Again, uh, again, when, when, when we reach to the, to the time of Jesus era during the first century, we know that through Jesus Christ, God has totally changed the paradigm of the temple because Jesus Christ was now a living world, a glory of God was among people in a human form. That was the desire of God since the Garden of Eden and that was desire in the wilderness and that was desire in the temple. But the, uh, the stipulation was that, that the nation and the people have to follow, they should be obedient to God. God's law. But anyway, they also abandoned God's law and they rejected God's new plan uh, uh, through Jesus Christ and they've been judged. And then this time God used Roman emperor to punish his people and the temple of Herod, which was under construction in Jesus' time. Jesus prophesied that there will be no stone which will be left on one another. Every one will be thrown down. And this prophecy Jesus prediction fulfilled as it is in on August 70 and a dominion common era Romans destroyed the second temple of Jerusalem and today only they have a one wailing wall where every Jewish uh, go over there and they weep and they celebrate well uh, fast forward we come to the 10th century in the in the un, uh, during the during the third century the Roman uh, Empire and the Roman Emperor uh, Constantine he won the war again as a sign under the cross and he thought that his victory his his militant victory is a sign of god and then he built Hagia sophia in the in the constantinople and established that city actually he was running away from his own interior war and he was finding a safe heaven however god raised turks and islam as a teacher to discipline the Christendom as God disciplined uh, Jewish nation through Babylonian and Romans, the same way God brought Islamic Caliphate to teach and to discipline Christendom. That's what Luther says. And when he was um, uh, remarking on his defense of 95 Thesis in 1518, what Luther perceived, he said that to fight against the Turks is the same as resisting God who visit our sins upon us with their rod. So he described Turks as the rod of God's wrath by which God is punishing the world and the church. So what is Christian perspective? Because today there is no Zion. Zion is there, but there is no temple. I don't know if Jewish nation is going to build third temple or not, but from Christian perspective, there is no need. Why? Because God has totally changed the whole paradigm. Uh, you remember I was sharing with you that David saw the heavenly court in a vision and then he received the master plan and replica on this earth. And now this time God says, no, no, I am not going to build another place for you. I am going to be in an original form among people, not at a physical place, but in a spiritual form. That's what Solomon questioned actually when he, when he uh, consecrated the temple and he asked questions, Second Chronicles chapter six, verse 18, he said, but will God really dwell on earth and with humans, question mark. And then he confessed the heavens, even the highest heavens cannot contain you. So it means the question was answered almost after thousand centuries and the modus operandi of sacrificial system moved from physical to spiritual, from shadow to original. And that's where we read John, Gospel of John, help us to understand this God's new modus operandi and which is, he says that the word, the actual word, God's word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So God's, you remember the God's dwelling place in the glory of, uh, in, the, in the form of a Shekinah glory. Now, John reminds us that we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth, and that is Jesus Christ. So the Christian concept is that God to totally changed the concept of one geographical place to a person. God changed this whole idea, and it become now God shifted from place to a person, new schema of sacrifices. So that is the Christian concept that 
Jesus Christ abolished the idea of God's presence at the one restricted geographic place and given a paradigm shift in the revelation. That's what God, when Jesus met with the Samaritan woman in the Gospel of John, we read there, Jesus said to the woman that, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain, which was Mount Gerizim for the Samaritans, nor yet at Jerusalem for the Jewish worship, because you worship, you know not what we know, what we worship for. So that was the reason God, Jesus said that you need to know actually who is God. And then Jesus revealed uh, 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 the, the, uh, the, uh, the striking revelation. And he says that God is spirit. It means that spirit does not dwell in any building or, or human made blocks. God required worship in spirit and truth. So God totally changed the whole idea. And as Mount Sinai was referring to Torah, Mount Zion was referring to God's dwelling place geographically restricted in the new era through Jesus Christ. God initiated a new era, which was through Holy Spirit. Now people become the house of God. It means this house of God, which is a spiritual house, is established on the cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ. Again, Psalms 118 verse 22 help us to understand that the stone which has been rejected by the builders become a cornerstone and who is this cornerstone jesus christ is the cornerstone you he is the living stone he is the precious stone he is the cornerstone make us into your spiritual house so paul remind us that do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God, you are not your own. So Jesus Christ as a high priest, Jesus Christ as a sacrifice, Jesus Christ as a cornerstone of the new spiritual house, he is entered on his ascension to the heavenly glory where now he's seated with God, the Father and the Son. So we need to understand that God's spirit is living among us. God's glory is living among us. We humans are now God's spiritual house that is what islamic sufism and mysticism realize that human beings are the house of god so we are the temple we are the new house and we are required to offer spiritual sacrifices so my dear friends if you're on a pilgrimage and uh, are you want to stay in the valley of becca which is morning dried in the dark place without hope performing shallow rituals and regulations no 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 you don't want to stay you want to reach the destination and destination is god's dwelling place which is now changed through jesus christ and now it become a spiritual house so remember the place baka is not a destination it's a transition so my muslim friends i think uh, you i hope you will revisit the interpretation of the valley of baka because i don't think so mecca is valley of baka because mecca is a place of hope. It's a meeting place of God for the Muslims. It is where they find comfort. It is where they find spiritual nourishment. So don't uh, mingle only the word with the, with the wrong understanding. So Becca is not Mecca. So if you are a true worshiper and seeking to worship God in spirit and truth, then my dear friend, I would like to invite you that truth is a person. It and his name is Jesus Christ. He claimed that I am the way and I am the truth. So my dear friends, Jesus Christ promised with his people what he's going to do if you are still in the valley of Baca. He promised through angel and he gave a revelation to his servant and what he claimed. Here is, here is the proclamation. And John says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. Remember, not place. And he dwell with them. Not you, need, no, you, you don't need to go and travel and pass through the valley of Baca or mourning or, or the death or the dried or everything. They will be his people. You don't need to make relationship with sacrifice. Sacrifice is already given and we are already sons and daughters of God. And God himself be with them and to be their God. Emmanuel, God is with us. And what he will do? Valley of Becca is tears. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain because the old order of things has passed away. This is the gospel and this is God's new schema and this is the spiritual house through Jesus Christ. My dear friend, 
I would like to invite you to come and join the spiritual horses. May God bless you and keep you under his wings. Amen.